Hi, I'm Matt Barry. I'm an independent filmmaker, and this is Low Budget Visions, where we celebrate personal DIY independent filmmaking. I'm joined today by Chris Watt, and Chris is, a, uh, is an award-winning screenwriter and script consultant. Uh, he's a member of the Writers Guild of Great Britain and Baptist Scotland, and is best known for writing the screenplay for the feature film Stalker, directed by Steve Johnson and starring Sophie Skelton and Stuart Brennan, which had its world premiere at Fright Fest in 2022. Uh, Chris is, uh, in addition to screenwriting, he's also a script reader and consultant uh, for a handful of screenplay, screenplay competitions, as well as through his own consultancy, The Script Courier, and is also the author of a novel, Peer Pressure, and a collection of poetry and shorter work, On the Lines, uh, which are both available through Amazon. Excuse me, it's On Lines, not On the Lines. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> um, all right, with that introduction, out of the way, I'd like to turn it over to you, Chris. Uh, you know, we have your uh, latest film that you've written, The Meyer, coming up. I'd like to hear more about that today. And uh, yeah, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to you if there's anything you'd like to say to introduce yourself, and we'll get right into the discussion. That's great. Thanks, Matt. It's also it's very nice when somebody mentions uh, the, the poetry collection because that usually gets left off my bio. So it's nice to have <laughs> a little bit of promotion for that there. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, as you said in your lovely introduction, I'm Chris Watt and I'm a screenwriter and a script consultant based in the UK. I'm based up here in Scotland um, and I've been working sort of in and out of the industry for about 20 years, but it's only been the last five years or so that the career has started to, I always, I always liken it to, to, I call it snowballing where, you know, it rolls down the hill and it gets bigger and bigger because I, it, it all started in film school back in 1998 for me. Uh, and after I graduated, I did, I, the naivety of youth, you just assume you're just going to go straight into film productions and you're going to be doing this, that, whatever, get a job at the BBC, you'll be set for life. And, it's just not that way, uh, particularly in the UK. Um, so there was 20 years of day jobs and uh, life gets in the way. And all the time I was I was constantly writing my own work just for me and trying to get stuff out there and trying to get stuff produced or optioned or commissioned. And it's, it's really, really tough. I'm sure any of your listeners, anybody involved in the industry at the very beginning knows that there are it's interesting whenever you are younger you read all these magazines about uh i mean i was 15 or 16 when pulp fiction came out so quentin tarantino was on the cover of every magazine going and he was so young and you always read about these filmmakers who have success when they're 22 23 years old and the only reason you read those articles the only reason those articles exist is because it is very rare the majority of people work in the industry there is about 20 odd years of just trying to get there and it it was kind of a it's almost a, a movie cliche in and of itself is that for years I was working in film journalism so between graduating film school and getting my first option as a screenwriter I, I wrote pieces for film websites and film magazines generally interviewing independent filmmakers and I started to accumulate this little network of independent filmmakers which really served me in a wonderful way now whenever I, I've still kept contact with those independent filmmakers and now we're all working within the same industry and it, it's been an interesting sort of like bridge between my old life and the life that I now have and it, as I say it was a cliche I'd been spending 10 years as a night manager in a hotel I'd you know working all these different sort of jobs and I had decided that I was going to give up screenwriting I thought I, I had a child at this point and I was, I just thought to myself, right, it's time to just start, do the grown up thing and put the dream to one side and just focus on a career. And it's uh, apparently I'm a night manager in a hotel. That's what I became. And so I said, I'm going to write one more screenplay. And that one screenplay, I then put into uh, a screenwriting competition f as part of the, uh, the British independent film festival. And it didn't win, but it was placed as a finalist. But one of the people that was judging that competition was an independent film producer named Stuart Brennan. And he contacted me two days after that festival was over and said, listen, I know the script didn't win, but I love that script. I'd like to option it. At this point, I'm 40 years old. I've never had an option before. I said, absolutely, sure, yep, great. And from that point, I was now officially a commissioned screenwriter. So I thought, right, okay, I'm gonna use what little clout this gives me and try and get some other things out there. And I wrote in, 
about the space about the space of about a month i wrote a little small independent horror thriller which at that time was a, a screenplay called freight uh and stuart wanted to read that too i gave him that script to read and he said well i could get this made this year uh and so the screenplay that he originally optioned got put onto the shelf onto the back burner and he optioned freight as well and freight turned out to be the film stalker and we went into production on that. And while that was in pre-production, going into production, I'd been having conversations with um, a, a filmmaker who, once again, this all goes back to the film journalism days. Um, I had reviewed uh, a, a, a feature film called Little Pieces by a director called Adam Nelson. Uh, and I'd given it a really good review. And he and I had become friendly off the back of that review on Twitter. And we always had back and forth for about five years. We had this little back and forth conversation. And he and I eventually decided, well, this this feels like a good time for you and I to maybe sit and talk about, should we do something together? And that that initial conversation became the genesis for me writing the screenplay for The Mire, which he then directed. Uh, in fact, it was very strange. It got filmed back to back from Stalker. So I think Stalker went into production. Then when they finished shooting that, The Mire went into production and that goes, yeah. And that is so rarely that that happens, particularly in independent British cinema. You just don't usually have something like that. So I had a really good year that year. And as I said, it's that idea of the snowball effect. From the moment I had two films that had been produced, I had written, the emails start coming in. I start getting the direct messages from producers looking for a writer for something they've been trying to get off the ground. And I started getting commissions. I started uh, having other producers wanting to read other pieces of my work. And now I find myself in development on a number of things. But as any screenwriter knows, a lot of these projects are never going to get past the development stage because there's only so much money to go around for any one project. And I think it's there is a truth to the idea that as a screenwriter, 90% of whatever you write throughout your entire career will probably never get made, but it's that 10%. So you have to try and make every script count i suppose and so that's that's kind of where i find myself now i'm sit sitting every day sitting down at a computer trying to think what's going to be the next project what am i doing next and of course the consultancy work uh that i do off the off the back of the screenwriting has been a real pleasure because it also is allowing me it, it's it's not a day job, but it feels like something that's kind of keeping the wolf in the door. That the, the the income you make from being a consultant facilitates the time it takes to write a screenplay. So it's it, it's been been quite a shift in my in my life in the last five years. But um, it's it's something that's welcome after twenty years of trying to get there. Sure, it sounds like it's kind of all you know come together uh, for you in a, in a way that that's made it possible to you know focus on it more screenwriting more or less full time and to really immerse yourself uh, in it. So that that's good to hear. I wanted to back up for just a minute because you mentioned you know coming up uh, you know with um, in the nineties you know the independent film and you mentioned like Pulp Fiction. To what degree would you say that that moment? Uh, because it, it's something I I think a lot about myself. Uh, and you mentioned sort of that myth of filmmakers having success right out of the gate, or at least, you know, a, a very select few having that kind of success. How do you feel that that influenced at that time your uh, thinking about entering the film business? Do you think it was, uh, would you say that that played a big part in how you, you know, thought that you'd have a career trajectory within that? Absolutely. It, it I think that the the 90s, particularly for US cinema, we had such an incredible renaissance of independent work. It seemed like every week in the 90s, there were two or three really extraordinary pieces of distinct individual work coming from the independent sector in, in a way that was, they were satisfying in a way that studio pictures just weren't at this point. And of course, studio pictures were gearing up into the era of the blockbuster, which really hit its peak, I suppose, in the noughties once we hit into the 2000s. It became all about franchises and IP and all sorts. Of, and it still is to an extent, but we are seeing now, I think, a very fundamental shift. I think we're going to have another renaissance of independent cinema coming up because I think the audiences are tired of the blockbuster thing now. It's, they're just not making their money back. They're becoming more and more expensive to make. Independent film for me was so incredibly important as a 15, 16 year old, knowing that I wanted to do something involved in filmmaking. I knew I was going to be a screenwriter because I always, I was always writing. So I was always interested in the process behind how a story is constructed, all of that stuff. 
But seeing the indie sector blow up the way it did with people like Quentin Tarantino, Kevin Smith with Clerks. I mean, Clerks was a hugely influential film for me as well. Richard Linklater, Slacker. And and his his later pictures, he's always kept that that mentality of almost the thing that Soderbergh does, which is the one for them, one for me sort of thing, where he can play the studio game, but he also can create these beautiful individual personal pieces. Steven Soderbergh's another great example, I think. I mean, Sex, Lies and Videotape came just at the end of the 80s, but he was another one of those filmmakers who was very young and got the success in his early 20s. And we still have those filmmakers today. I mean, Damien Chazelle, I think, is a very good example of that lately because he's so young. I think he's the youngest filmmaker to win the Best Director Oscar. I think he's and, and an extraordinary talented person, but it is a very rare thing. But there were many, many signature moments. Pulp Fiction was a big deal, I think, for a lot of people that were getting into film at that time, just simply because it announced that a different that there are different ways to tell a story and 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 it wasn't the first film to do this sort of non-linear structure he was he was ripping off Godard and and Truffaut and those sort of people but but it to put it within that semi mainstream context and then the marketing of course i mean we we can say what we want hindsight is a wonderful thing we can say an awful lot about miramax but in the 90s miramax was a sign that you were about to get something very very interesting there their marketing patterns and the way they distributed their films and the way they backed certain filmmakers was very, very important. Now we know the context behind all that is actually not as sweet as it sounds, but they were responsible for bringing some of the, probably the most sort of like formative and important, certainly American films that I was seeing at the time and films that I probably wouldn't have been aware of had it not had that kind of juggernaut mentality about they they marketed these little independent movies like they were studio pictures, and that's why they were so successful. And that that's a template that no, I don't see any other branch of the industry in any other country can really replicate. And that mm-hmm. and I think that's probably down to financing as well. Here in the UK, we don't have the marketing bucks to spend on that sort of stuff. So when we make a small independent film and it does well overseas usually it's had the backing of another studio behind it i think you think of things like the full monty that had 20th century fox behind it when it came to the u.s distribution so they had that marketing push so it made a lot of money in the states in the way that if that film hadn't had that marketing push it wouldn't have made a dent nobody would have gone to see that movie um because that's because it's a very sort of it's a very typically british sensibility a film like that does very well in this country regardless of marketing because it's the kind of thing that audiences like to see in this country we like to see ourselves reflected back to us usually with more optimism than the sort of the grimness that you get with a kitchen sink drama but no i think you're absolutely right that independent films for me were they they were they were my jam when I was fifteen. You know, I, they were the only things I was watching. I did, in fact, I kind of, I had that snotty kind of film snobbishness about. I I I, I sort of wouldn't really take on a studio film at that point. It was all about the indies right. for me. So my friends would go off and see a big studio film. I'd be like, no, I'm not going to see that. That's 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 nonsense. And and of course, you know, the naivety of youth. I mean, some of the studio the studios were still making good movies, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but it is interesting to look back on it now because you look at what the studios are producing now and it is mainly franchised material. And there is something very boring about it. Now I long for the times when studios used to put their money where their mouth is like the seventies when you had things like French connection was considered a blockbuster. The Godfather was a blockbuster, the exorcist Serpico. We were making movies that, you know, that were, really serious pieces of work and were aimed towards a mature audience whereas most blockbusters these days are aimed towards kids and that's not to say that there aren't good blockbusters out there there are but the independent films are always where i find the most nourishment in terms of creativity and they always inspire me and i love hearing about how those films were made and you know even even going into the noughties you had filmmakers like noah bambach who were still sort of carrying that 90s torch because of course he started in the 90s with things like kicking and screaming but he man he has managed to negotiate his career in a way where he still has that independent spirit but he's got the backing of uh better financing and better marketing now and stars 
it's interesting because I, I I think I'm a few years younger than yourself, but I very much too kind of came up in that in the '90s moment and very much kind of in the in the thrall of directors like Tarantino and Kevin Smith. And even though I was a little young to see their films on you know first run, I was very much aware of them. I mean, it loomed very very large in the in the you know media. Anybody following film, I think at that time was aware of it. And there was, as you say, a kind of there was a certain appeal to it. I think that it stood in contrast to Hollywood and especially the types of films that Hollywood studios were making at that time. And it's interesting that you mentioned the films of the seventies, because that's another aspect of this that I think often gets overlooked that the films of the seventies also, at least, at least here in the U S um, loomed very large, I think for a generation of filmmakers, that it was almost a kind of uh, there was almost a sense that Hollywood had this you know, brilliant moment where, like you say, the studios were really getting behind movies like The French Connection and, you know, directors like, uh, you know, Scorsese and Coppola. But at the same time, it was almost as if Hollywood had had lost its way somewhat, I think, by the 90s. There was a sense that, yes, they were still making entertaining movies, and but there was definitely a, a desire for the qualities that independent films were, I, were seen as providing, you know, more personal kind of cinema, uh, more you know what we might call auteur driven director driven uh, i think know. i think storytelling has a great deal to do with that as well because from the 80s onwards when when digital when special effects started to become more the driving force behind the blockbuster they started to become more about concepts than about story and mm -hmm. and you see that even at this point now i, I always liken it to i've said this uh, to friends before i say how, why is it i can remember every single story beat of Raiders of the Lost Ark but if you give me one of the newer Transformers movies I have no idea what the story of that of those Transformers movies you don't remember the story in the way that you remember the story of those movies the early period of the blockbuster was back whenever they were being written by proper high caliber writers I mean the first Superman movie was written by Mario Puzo for goodness sake <laughs> who wrote right. The Godfather so, uh, we don't have those sort of writers being given these large franchise materials anymore that although interestingly enough it seems like a lot of like marvel does tend to pull from the indie film crowd as well they take on a lot yeah. of directors and writers from independent cinema but the, the problem is that within that juggernaut sensibility they lose all their individuality and in the things that make them distinctive as storytellers you know to uh, it it see it seems like it it kind of backtracks on itself they say oh we want what that filmmaker has and then once they get it, they did it with Edgar Wright, I think, with Ant-Man. They said, oh, he's he's a great comedy director and he can do action. We want what Edgar Wright does. And as soon as they brought him into the production process and he starts bandying his big ideas about it, they go, oh, no, wait, this is not what we want. We have a template that we're working off and you don't fit into that template. I worry about the way the bigger studio blockbusters are bracketing and pigeonholing things into templates because it does mean that we are left with a succession of movies that are pretty much the same movie over and over again. Yeah. And I, I want to get to your thoughts on the state of indie film in the UK in a minute, mm -hmm. but uh, to, to kind of get there, I wanted to talk about your the upcoming film, The, the Mire, uh, which you mentioned was produced on a very low budget, uh, relatively low budget um, yeah. and independently. Um, now you had told me uh, that this was shot in the wake of the second lockdown in the UK, right, with the production, the crew in a kind of a production bubble. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the experience um, of how that film was made. And you can actually talk a little bit about the uh, process of getting it started as well, you know, any kind of lead up to uh, the production. But I'd be interested in hearing about that in the production under those circumstances uh, specifically. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the Meyer, obviously, the the genesis of the Meyer came from talking with Andrew Nel uh, with Adam Nelson. And one, once we had the script in development, it is interesting because we were developing the script through the COVID pandemic. So everybody was in lockdown. Everybody was at home. I didn't even meet Adam Nelson face to face in person in the same room until the night of the premiere of the movie. Once it was done, everything was done via Zoom calls because I live up in Scotland and he lives right down at the bottom of England, right at the bottom of the country. So meeting up for meetings was not really something that was ever going to happen. But the the filmmaking process for that was really interesting. We knew that it was going to be a film that we, we wanted it to be 
made with a commercial sensibility. We want to make a thriller. We want to make something that would have an audience on the edge of their seats, that would grip them. Uh, we knew we weren't going to have the kind of money to get any names attached to it. So the concept had to be really good. The story had to be really good. And I, and I worked incredibly hard on the script. Once all that was in place, the financing side of things really came from crowdfunding. And I think that you've probably talked to a few filmmakers who will say the same thing, that crowdfunding really seems to be the way that most certainly micro budget films get made these days you see crowdfunders just constantly online from people and we we did we actually did three crowdfunders for this because it took a long time to accumulate the budget that we needed and also at any point in the the pre-production process when it looked like we were going to get everybody together to shoot there was a new restriction would come in with COVID and it would just knock back the schedule three or four months. I think at one point we were going to film in February of, I want to say 2021. And then there was a six month delay before we could get them in there. I think they ended up shooting it in October of that year. And it was a case of looking at what could be done within the restrictions. And it was the same actually with my other film, Stalker. The whole reason behind writing that was it was a film about two people trapped in an elevator. And I only wrote that because I knew these COVID restrictions were coming in, which were going to mean fewer cast, less locations, less crew needed. And and so the mire was the same sensibility. We knew we were going to have to bubble up the crew. We're going to have to have it set pretty much in one location. And in the case of the mire, it's this huge King's Church in Portsmouth, which is this incredible, but I mean, talk about production value. It's it's as cinematic as you can get. So we were very lucky in that respect. It certainly beats a very small elevator in terms of cinematic scale. But um, once we had the script in place, we had the cast in place, and we had the uh, the uh, production crew in place, it was about bubbling up. And I mean, I was never there on the day uh, for any of the shooting because I was up in Scotland. I was working on another film at that point. But um, I was getting reports back every day from Adam about... How, how tough it was because you had to shoot in COVID restrictions. You had, the, you had to mask up. Everybody had to keep a distance to a certain degree. And it, it was a process that, you know I, know, I know Adam won't mind me saying, the film was actually shot in seven days. It's a feature film shot in seven days, which <clears throat> I hope for anybody when they finally see the film, they'll look at it and say, that's really impressive, particularly when you look at what the actors do in the film, because it's a, it's a huge undertaking. It's it's driven by dialogue and character. It's a character piece, essentially. But it's also a thriller, so we wanted it to have aspects that were going to grip and sort of like... I'm always looking to pull the audience in. You want the audience to continually be moving towards the screen and then sitting back in shock. So in terms of the production, the crowdfunding aspect of it was very, very difficult. Uh, even more difficult in that we had to do it three times. And for anybody who has crowdfunded, I'm sure they they can sympathize in the fact that you it's every single day you have to be doing three or four posts a day you have to keep the momentum going on it you have to have a good first day as well that's what they always say make sure that you've got somebody throwing a very large chunk of change in at the first day otherwise the momentum already starts to tail off and you know we could have probably gone to funding bodies in the uk but the worry there was that we were going to lose a little bit of control because as soon as you get these other financiers and other funding bodies involved there occasionally there'll have to be compromises in the subject matter there might be compromises in your casting and we didn't want that and and adam was very adamant that he wanted to shoot a film in portsmouth whereas most uk Set, certainly English set films uh, they tend to just be shot in London and they tend to be focused on London. And there's a huge regional aspect to the UK, which I don't think is ever capitalised on fully. We have the same thing up here in Scotland. I mean, I live uh, just outside of the city of Aberdeen on the northeast coast. <clears throat> Nobody makes films here. It's either Edinburgh or Glasgow, and it's mostly Glasgow because they've got a, a, a fairly decent studio system there. Uh, although most of the studios are being used by uh, Hollywood productions, which is interesting. There's not that many original UK productions coming out of our own studios, which is a, a strange way for the industry to work. But uh, unfortunately, that seems to be the, the way things go. But in terms of the production, you know, it it, it wasn't a long shoot for the Meyer, but the, the, the post-production took a very long time. Because again, we had to crowdfund again to raise more funds for the because post-production ended up costing more than I think we probably anticipated. 
and then it became just that 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 waiting period. Uh, and it's something film school never teaches you. They never tell you. They can teach you how to light a scene. They can tell you how to do three act structure. They can tell you how to work with actors. They never tell you just how much waiting is involved in any production between development to pre-production to the shoot to post-production and then from post-production to actually getting the film released can be a very long time and in in, in the case of the Meyer it's a, it's a very good case study I think in in how the distribution element in the UK seems to be working at the moment very very difficult to get sold I have a question for you before we get to the distribution aspect. Mm. Uh, you're talking about the crowdfunding. I was curious if you found that the, the process of crowdfunding was useful for promoting the project in, in the larger sense. You know, in, in other words, it's not just to raise the money, but also just to simply let people know, like, hey, we're working on this. This is going to be coming soon. Would you say that the crowdfunding can act as a part of the promotional process for the film as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think that that's also quite important for other filmmakers, I think, to understand is that you see so many crowdfunders where they seem to have done the bare minimum and they don't see it as an opportunity to market your not just market the film, but market yourselves as well. Most of us were, you know, I, I might have two feature films behind me and you know, I've got my IMDb credits, but I, I still don't have an agent. I don't have representation. I work freelance for myself. I have cultivated the work and I've cultivated the networking relationships with producers myself. So you have to be able to sort of self-promote to an extent. And I always worry when I look at my online presence, I worry if I'm alienating people, but then I think to myself, no one else is going to do it. You, you have to, you just have to promote and, and hope that you can do it creatively and to, and to, and to sort of offer people something a little bit more. I think because I work as a consultant as well, I am offering more than just saying, hey, I make films. I'm like, hey, I'll help you with your work as well. And I think that works. But in terms of the crowdfunding, absolutely. It, it, it allowed us through the very frustrating moments and, and the waiting period to have a, a way to sort of at least let people know that we are still working on this, that we are trying to make this the best film we could. And also to let people know that the film that we wanted to make was not just going to be uh, one of these films, you know, you hear about people making low budget films all the time. And then when you finally see them, it looks like Adam Adam is very keen on that. He uses this, this line all the time. He says, it looks like it was shot in your grandmother's living room because it was, you know, there never seems to be much in a way. Produ people haven't been creative enough with production value or looking at ways of, fiscally doing a lot with very little. I always look at the Danny Boyle template. He's always been very, very good at taking relatively small budgets and making them look huge. I mean, you think of his movie uh, Sunshine, which was a big science fiction blockbuster, or at least it looked like it. That movie didn't cost very much money to make, but it looked like it cost about $80 million to make, and it cost a fraction of that. So I've always looked at, uh, and I only look at it from a writing point of view, but, you know, I've worked with producers and directors and you have to be kind of conscious, even at the writing stage of the limitations you might have with budget. And the earlier I think you understand that in the writing process, the easier it will be for the director and producer to then know what you intend with the script and then whether or not that will be feasible. So when I look at something like The Meyer, it actually seems to have a lot more scale than anything we even envisioned at the time just simply because we had the luxury of time to work on it and make sure that we had it that good yeah i have to say i thought the production values were you know excellent and uh, it seems like you really got the most out of your budget um you know i, I wanted to uh just say a, a quick comment on the aspect of promotion because i think it's something a lot of independent filmmakers aren't entirely comfortable with and you you made this point about you you, you kind of worry sometimes like almost you know are you risking alienating people and i think but what you said really gets at the heart of it, which is that if you don't do it, no one else is. And right. it can be a, a lot of work and, and it can be a lot of uh, a lot of self you know, promotion, but it is necessary. And uh, so I, I think it's great to hear that you've been uh, doing that and that you've had success with your own you know, consulting work as well. I mean, especially when you're, uh, as you say, a freelancer. I, I, that's it's uh, really your bread and butter there. So it is a message that I think a lot of independent filmmakers like have to, kind of have to hear sometimes that even if you're not comfortable with self promotion, you really do have to uh, learn to get comfortable with it because it really no one else is going to do that for you. Um, that's right. Yeah. But yeah, the the, the uh, crowdfunding process does seem like it can be a good a good way to to put attention on an individual film. 
you know, mm. because if you're raising the money, it allows people to follow that process. And, uh, you know, also I think to feel like they're a part of the, the making of the film, if they've contributed money and just being able to see it as it goes along. Um, but, you know, to get back to your point of, that you were, you were saying about the, the production value and everything, yeah, I think that is something that really comes through in the film. Uh, the, you know, the sense of production design uh, can, creates a very convincing you know, on-screen uh, world. You know, it feels right. It feels very. That's good, uh, that's good to hear yeah. because that because you know we are at the point now where we're getting ready, we're we're prepping it for release, but it's been such a long time since the film was actually shot. So it's nice mm. to hear that people are having, even in an early capacity, a, a good reaction to how the film is made it's, it's turning out to not be the film that maybe people thought it was going to be and i think that's great because we want it to be laced with surprises when we when we when we did the premiere uh last year in portsmouth in this beautiful cinema down in the harbor there um we had a full house and it was wonderful to sit there with an entire with a full house i think it was like 400 or 500 people i think were in there uh which was great to have it to have it be packed and sold out but adam and i were sitting down at the front and there's an element I'll, I'll give no spoilers but something happens in the third act which is really shocking and the entire audience gave a gasp and that made the hell of two years worth of trying to get this movie made suddenly completely worth it because adam and i just looked at each other like got him we got yeah, him. And but that, that's that's all i ask <laughs> that really i to me that's that is the best part is seeing it all come together and being able to see it with an audience and yeah. getting that reaction you know that's why yeah i i think seeing seeing the movie on on the big screen and with with an audience is a, truly a memorable experience every time it's, i'm really glad to hear that you, you you had that with this film and that you know like that that moment you're describing worked and got yeah. the reaction you were looking for um, do you want to talk a little bit about that distribution process that you're going through? I mean, share share what you can, you know, uh, but I think it's, it is interesting and it's something that doesn't get talked about enough in relation to independent film. Absolutely, because it's, it's something that we're still in the midst of at the moment. I mean, the reality of, in particular in the UK film industry, is that if you don't have a name attached to your film, there, there's very little prospect of it getting into cinema screenings so you know the the fact that we had the premiere and got to see it on the big screen other than within a festival sort of capacity is probably the only time we're going to be able to see that film on a big screen unless you know something happens 10 years down the line i don't know but um in terms of distribution we've been working for over a year now at just trying to look at independent distribution looking at the distributors who maybe are going to be offering us a decent deal and you've got to be very very careful because there's an awful lot of uh kind of cowboy distributors out there and the deals are never you have to really look carefully at the small print because sometimes those deals are really gonna screw a filmmaker out of what what little profits your film might actually get you're probably never going to see and for us we found and that after nearly a year's worth of frustration looking at ways at which we could get this film out there, it became more a case of just probably self-distributing it and to try and get it out there ourselves. And so we are looking at the streaming services that will take us on. You know, we're in the process of licenses are being given for certain streaming services. and all sorts of, So the film is on its way to coming, but it's it, it's such an unusual process. But And, and it's frustrating too, because the, the, the industry here that, they all like to talk. They talk a big talk about independent film and they talk a big talk about wanting to promote uh, fresh talent and creative new perspectives and things like that. But often it's it's only at the expense of making sure the film has a sellable aspect to it. And I understand that, particularly in the UK, we, we, we have to, our funding bodies are generally charity based. Like the BFI is charity based. It comes from national lottery money and we, they can only hand out a certain amount to filmmakers. So they want to make sure that the films that they're handing them out to and the projects they're handing them out to are going to have something that's at least going to allow it to make its money back that has to justify the money that's being spent on it. And it's incredibly frustrating, I know, for filmmakers who don't have the access to that kind of funding and that don't have access to stars or, don't, you know, on Stalker, we were really lucky in that we were dealing with a production company and we had an executive producer uh, Gareth Wiley, who'd won a Golden Globe, he used to work with Woody Allen. I think, uh, you know, so having that open doors and that managed to get us things like stars from uh, TV, a TV show like Outlander or something like that, or 
uh, or very surreally, we got uh, Brett, the Hitman Hart, to do a, a cameo in that movie, which is very strange, but it had its place. But anyway, to get back to the mire, that we didn't have an aspect like that. We didn't have a sellable element. And what I find interesting is that when we were talking to American distributors, they were actually quite keen on the mire because even though it doesn't have any stars, apparently American audiences have a thing for films about cults. They like that side of things. They like that subject matter. So we were finding we were getting a lot better uh, interest from American uh, distributors and uh, people like that than we were from the British. And that that I thought was a big eye opener. So uh, I'm keeping that filed away for later if I want to write something else. Um, but in terms of the UK distribution pattern, it's it's almost impossible to certainly get a cinema release or even a DVD release for a film like The Mire just simply because of the nature of how it was made and the fact that there 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 aren't any sellable elements to it. Which you know, as somebody who create helped create the damn thing, you know, and I know there are elements to. It. I know an audience is going to like it. I know that an audience is going to get something from it. It's got good acting. It's got I think a gripping story. It's well made for what we made it for. It, it doesn't look like what it costs to make. It looks like it costs a lot more. It's just that you know, if uh, if a distribution house was going to put money behind that and market it it's not guaranteed you're going to make that money back. So you, you generally see that in the UK. Most of the films that are quote unquote low budget, they still have either a major name directing it or they have a star attached to it. And they're considered the the breakout successes in the British in the British film industry each year. But you think to yourself, well, it's a breakout success. But, you know, I, I, I think of films like uh, Wild Rose, the one with Jesse Buckley. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys got that over there. I'm, I'm pretty sure it probably played over there. It was about a, a young girl in Glasgow who wants to be a country and Western singer. Uh, but that film had Jessie Buckley in it. And at that point, she was a name in the UK. Uh, she's more of a name now, but th that was enough to guarantee it, you know, I, I think like £2 million pounds and £2 million pounds, uh, funding for for independent filmmakers like ourselves we could probably make two films off of that three films off of that <laughs> so you know it's it, it's that kind of give and take but you have to remember that that two million pounds also goes towards a lot of other elements and they're going to be marketing the film once it's made and you never know if these things are going to work it's very catch-22 in the uk because we don't have access to a huge amount of financing um it didn't used to be that way and then again the 90s was very good for british cinema as well we had the uh we had the new wave of British filmmakers like Danny Boyle. I remember being 15 when Shallow Grave came out, which was his first feature film. I remember I remember sitting watching Shallow Grave and just thinking, I have never seen a British film that has this kind of energy that feels like, and this feels like an American movie almost, but it's a little nasty murder mystery set in Glasgow. So, and then from there he went on to train spotting, which was this huge phenomenon. But again, Train spotting became huge uh, internationally. It had Miramax behind it whenever it went to the US. So that already they're spending more probably than the budget of the entire movie cost to actually promote the damn thing. And you know, we see we see that in the US with the uh, the studio system. They're doing that at the moment. They're spending so much on promoting and marketing these movies that it almost makes it impossible for these even the blockbusters to make their money back. You think about something like Indiana Jones, the last Indiana Jones. I think the production budget on that was something like 300 million, which seems insane. But then if you imagine that you have to almost double that for marketing, that movie has to that movie has to make the better part of a billion dollars before it's going to even break even. It's a, it's not a system that can maintain for very long and that's why I think it's it's great to think that we're going to get back to indie roots soon and it would be nice to see us get back to that sort of 70s sensibility of story first over concept or over what is what is the thing that's going to make this sellable what because a, a lot of production executives think in terms of marketplaces and think in terms of demographics and when you're right and you're in the when you're in the grassroots of filmmaking you just want to tell a really good story and hope that it gets told really well and then just pray to whatever god you believe in that it'll get seen because it, it, it it's easier than ever now to actually physically make a film Soderbergh showed us you can make a feature film on an iPhone but getting it seen by people now a lot a lot more difficult yeah that is the challenging part and it's something you know I, I talk with a lot of filmmakers who release who self-release their films onto YouTube I mean I, I do that myself um, just to get them out there 
and you know that that is the that is always the issue is how do you kind of rise above the uh, the noise of all the other online content? I forget where I had heard this said, but it, it, it you're not just competing against other movies, but you're competing against you know uh, TikTok and Instagram yes. and social media and it's it's basically yeah you're you're trying to especially if you you know if you're self releasing into the online environment where you don't have the advantage of you know, the Hollywood marketing budget behind that's you. Right. The, the algorithm because it becomes your friend. Right, the algorithm, right. Is, the algorithm is king uh, in online yeah. materials. So, so, you know, unless you're tagging everything incredibly specifically, you're not going to reach a target audience. It's, it, it's, it takes so much time. It takes a mm -hmm. lot out of you, I think. And I think sometimes that can sap a filmmaker's creativity a little bit. And I think we all get those lulls in our... It, it, we all have those days where you just think... Maybe I'll just give up and go and work a day job. But the creative process is so addictive. I think that you, you, you one one good day and you're back on the horse. Yeah, a, a common um, sentiment I'm hearing from a number of filmmakers I speak with, uh, you know, who who take this approach is that they they view it as a kind of the you know like a, a long long tail game in the sense of putting the films out there and you know it may not instantly catch on. It may not you know, may not get a lot of views or attention right out of the gate but it's about making the film available for you know it could be years down the road now i realize if you're trying to make money back if you have a large investment in the film that's not really uh yeah. maybe the most sound strategy but you know if it, if like at least for, for myself where it's just about you know just creating the work uh simply because i enjoy doing it yeah i i, I kind of take solace in the idea that all right you know maybe it's not going to get much attention right now but who knows maybe five even ten years down the road you know somebody will stumble across this and enjoy it and i think that's uh at, at least at the level i'm coming at it from that is something that kind of keeps me going but again i realize with uh you know when you when you're dealing with investors and budgets and having to make that money back it's a very different different game of course it it is and uh, you, you know you're right it's a marathon not a sprint and i think that the the, the way that you're working you know, it, 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 there's something so admirable about just putting the creative process out there because you enjoy doing it. And and if you're able to do that, I think that's brilliant. And there's there's so much creative energy out there. I know so many great creative people, in particular screenwriters, because I read a lot of scripts every week. And there is good stuff out there. But you just know the sad reality is that that read that I'm doing just as a consultant might be the only time I'm seeing that movie play because nine times out of 10, these things are never going to get made. There's just so much material out there and not everything can get made. And it is about finding a way to keep going. It, it is a cliche, but you just have to keep going. And who knows in 10 years time, the, the Meyer, I think is a good example of that in the same way that you are. We are only really indebted to the people that put into the crowdfunder and they're the ones that are still waiting for the movie and most of them have been able to see it through private screeners that we have and all that sort of stuff but we want it to be available for everybody and who knows 10 years down the line we don't know where our careers are going to go whether or not this movie is going to be recalled 10 years from now and steve martin i remember always said that back in the day he did a movie called pennies from heaven right after the jerk and it was an absolute bomb and nobody understood it because it was a dark, serious, artistic piece of work. But now, out of the context of the filmography and the timeline, that movie just seems like an absolute gem because you're not remembering that came after The Jerk. You're just watching a great movie. And I I, I like the idea that in 10 years' time, The Meyer will be discovered by someone and they'll, they'll go, wow, that was really something. What else did these people do? And hopefully we'll have a whole bunch of other films that we'll have done. Indeed. I, I want to ask you kind of a last question here. Um, sure. And, and and I don't want to, you know, repeat anything you've already uh, shared with us, but do you have any additional insights into the differences you see between the just the concept of independent film or indie film between the UK and the US? What it seems to be for me is, and I think a lot of it comes down to scale. I think that in the States, there is access to more money. It, it, it's a larger place. There's more people there. So there are more production companies. The UK only has a finite amount of production companies and all and, and not all of them have much in the way of access to money. And in fact, I think a lot of the financiers for any independent production in the UK come from overseas and come from foreign territories as well. Uh, we see that whenever you look at, when you look at any British independent film, on DVD, there's usually about three minutes before the opening credits of just production company names coming up because there's about 20 people 
20 production companies that are needed to get these films made. I think it's a ma- it is a matter of money at the end of the day. We we are smaller, we don't have as much access to the capital that maybe the US has. We we also I think don't have much of we don't have a studio system. We don't really have big production value in that sense. And distribution again is is really key to that. We have many many different ways of getting distribution out there, but how many of them actually bite with something that doesn't have a commodity attached or something like that? And I think most independent filmmakers are are finding it really really difficult to actually even get their project off the ground at this point, just simply because they 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 I think they have the the expectation that they need to have a really large sum of money in order just to get the film made. And I don't think that's necessarily a thing. I think you need the money for after the film is made so that you can actually market this thing and you can actually get more people interested in it. And it it feels like to me, we're we're only seeing a, we only see a handful of films in the independent sector in this country actually making much in a way profit. In fact, I was looking at the statistics the other day and I think that in terms of profits, I think independent cinema is like down by nearly 50% in terms of revenue that has come from independent productions in this country, which might there might be a little bit of COVID has something to do with that. But I, I think generally we haven't seen it shift yet. So it seems it's astonishing to me that most people seem to be giving their time and their money to, more, I think, dependable productions. I think, you know, the ones that have got the stars behind them, most people know, oh, well, I know where I am with a Jason Statham movie. So I'll watch a Jason Statham movie over a little independent movie that I don't know any of the people that are in it, even if perhaps I like the subject matter. I think it's about playing the game in the UK. I, I'm very conscious as a writer that I want to be able to write things that could be done within a reasonable budget because, you know, I'm I'm actually aiming at this point for budgets around the £5 million mark, which I know when you look at what is considered low budget in US filmmaking, uh, that might seem like a, a ridiculous amount of money, but five million can get you in this country, can get you a star, can get you a good set built, can get you a really good cinematographer, you know, and it gives you a better chance. Of it. So I'm sort of playing that game and also looking at genre. We can, we, we seem to generate in the independent sector, we seem to generate an awful lot of horror movies because horror sells because it's, e- it's easier to make a horror movie that will make some money back than any other genre really. And, that that seems to be where he's at. but I I get very bored, and it is interesting that I've made my career off the back of a horror movie. I've got six or seven other screenplays that are character comedies or dramas or romantic comedies, and nobody wants those. But you say you've got a horror, they're like, give me that because it will make money. So I think genre plays a part in it. We it, it all goes in waves, um, and it it'll be nice to it'll be nice to sort of back away from that. I'm kind of getting there now the mire is a step back from horror uh and from the mire i'm going on to other projects that are uh working more in the character drama side of things so that's the, that's where i want to sort of edge away which is not to say that i won't do another horror i've got ideas but i'm i'm quite particular about it but in terms of the feasibility of getting those films made you do have to play the game you do have to give the it is like the soderberg pattern you do one for them one for yourself you have to do the the movie that's going to make money in order to get the money to make the movie that might make money so it's it, it's it's a slippery slope but um it also it also make it also makes life quite exciting as a creative as well because you never you never know if, if something's going to work or if something's going to hit we don't know with the mire the mire might come out and everybody <laughs> Everybody goes bananas for it. I don't know, it, uh, but of course the marketing is going to be down to us. It's not we don't have uh, a marketing team behind it. It's going to be the filmmakers saying, "Please download and watch our movie." Well, that's great. Uh, thanks for sharing those insights, and I hope that the buyer uh, comes out soon. And uh, you know, we'll, I'll make sure to share any information that you can send me about that when it happens. No, oh, thank uh, you. Before we sign off, is there any? Last things you'd like to say? Any last projects you'd like to promote? Um, in terms of promotion, I don't really have it. It's the funny thing about being a screenwriter. Often, it's like waiting for a bus. Two will come along at the same time. And I've, uh, between Stalker and The Mire, I've now spent the last two years just writing and in development on things. And the problem with the de- again, it's the difference between maybe the US and the UK. When you go into development in the UK, 
think it'll be five years before you see any movement on a project. So I've, I, I've written maybe four or five feature films since The Mire. And I've been... And, you know, I've been paid my commission for them and then they go into development and uh, I'll start work on them again when they get development money. But nine times out of 10, that development money won't come. So in terms of things to promote, really, it's just the fact that I am available as a script consultant. I do have my own consultancy. If you go to my uh, Twitter slash X, it's not X, it's always Twitter as far as I'm concerned. Um, I, I I can be found at uh, all lowercase the Chris Watt. Um uh, I'm also on Instagram under the same name uh, where I do, I'm an amateur hobbyist photographer. So come along and share your photos with me. Uh, I, I actually, I think of all the social media, Instagram is my favorite just because it's a purely visual thing. But uh, in terms of promotion, I've got a short film uh, that is doing the festival run at the moment called The Pursuit of Independence, which I co-wrote, which is a little film that was shot in Glasgow. Uh, and it's just working on other things. And, uh, you know, leading on from the fact that we connected over the last person you interviewed Hamish Downey Hamish Downey and I are working on a project together as well that I'm that I'm trying to get written up for him so there might be something else in the works there but it's all development for me at the moment so as much as it might seem like I'm quiet and there's nothing coming out there's constantly stuff being generated it's just could be another few years before you see anything Got a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. Well, that, that's great yeah. to hear. And uh, Chris, thank you for coming on here today, speaking with me and sharing your insights. And I hope, uh, you know, wish you all the best of luck with the release of the Meyer and future projects. And I'll make sure to put your social media links in the description of this video so people know where to find you. Um, thank you. Yeah. All right. It was great speaking with you. And thanks again. Oh, you too, Matt. Thanks a lot. Cheers.